Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to IAC lecture series. Welcome to our houses here in Barcelona. Welcome to Marcela's house back in Brazil. Um, hello, Marcela. It's great hello. to have you. It's great to have you with us. Uh, just a very short uh, introduction um, of today's lecture with uh, Marcela del Signore. Uh, Marcela, apart from a very good uh, friend, uh, she's um, an architect, she's an urbanist, she's an expert on, on um, exploring uh, and defining um, new urban phenomena and spaces um, that integrate different kind of technologies and different kind of uh, socio, socio technical systems as well. So um, part of her last publication um, uh, in the book, uh, Urban Machines, published by List Lab, that is also co-hosting this event with us today, um, is a book focused on understanding the emerging public space through technologies, through data-driven processes, through computational processes, but also material and fabrication prototypes um, uh, and how this um, applied to urban and, and public space can change the way that we inhabit and the way that we interact. So I think that uh, part of the work of Marcela is more relevant than ever, especially now that our public space is a virtual one, is a technologically enhanced one, um, or, or better said, it's purely a digital one at the moment. So um, uh, Marcela is also an associate professor of architecture at the New York uh, Institute of Technology. And in her normal life commutes between New York and Rio de Janeiro um, <laughs> and, and Italy. Uh, so she's um, among three continents and countries, let's, let's say, uh, among two continents uh, and three countries. And um, I think that uh, it will be an important um, uh, talk today and discussion afterwards about how technology will affect uh, and is affecting the urban space, the public space and our interactions. So Marcela, thank you for being here uh, with us. Just to inform everybody that is participating that you are all welcome to use the Q&A uh, section of this webinar in order to share your questions. At the end of the talk, uh, we will have the possibility to um, um, select some of the questions, but also um, whoever wants to interact um, directly with Marcela, that would also be possible with questions, uh, doubts, and, and sharing thoughts. Um, no more to add from my side. Marcela, it's great to virtually have you with us um, and, and looking forward uh, to your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Areti. So thank you for the introduction and thank you to Yak, uh, to, host me, to host me tonight to, um, and for the invitation as well. So I'm very excited to be here and, uh, and be here with these expanded communities of friends, colleagues, students and more. So thanks also everyone that uh, connected to, uh, you know, took the time tonight to, to uh, connect and uh, engage with the discussion. So I hope that the lecture will trigger some thoughts, uh, you know, during the lecture itself, also for the discussion afterwards. Um, so I will start with the title. Um, the title, uh, so the lecture is titled Geographies of Encoded Matter. And as I already was talking about, uh, the lecture itself talks about how the intersection of technologies with the public, social and cultural realm through a series of means, through prototyping, material and fabricated systems, data-driven protocols and mediated environment. So the lecture will be developed through a series of uh, framework, more theoretical framework, uh, that in a way frame the works that you will see, but also through projects uh, that will be the vehicle to speculate on current and future states of socio-technical systems uh, and how they are connected to, um, to, to, to cities, to ecosystems, to the earth and to the planetary scale. Uh, looking in particular uh, at information, data, agency, and technologically enabled narratives. Uh, also, we'll uh, talk about the book, uh, uh, Urban Machines, uh, Public Space in a Digital Culture, Public by List, that is co-hosting this event, uh, already talked about. Um, and uh, I will talk about the book as a, as a mediating between the first part and, and, and the second part that will show some of the projects also my project also that all part of the book itself. 
Um, so in particular, the lecture uh, will touch upon connected teams and in particular will talk about the relation and, and inter and transcalar nature of the terms. So starting from interconnectedness as a framework, I will expand on the public realm and domain and social technical systems as interdependent. So understanding what is the relationship between the two, linking the discussion through the book itself, and then ending with four projects as, uh, uh, as, uh, as a way to talk about social technical acts through these four terms, trust code, network, inform, and embody. So why geographies of encoded matter? So in this context, geographies here are intended as the arrangement and interrelation of the world as a whole. Matter here is intended as a substance that can reconfigure itself into an intelligent construct that is both produced and, pro uh, and productive, generated and generative. Encoding here is intended as the process of applying a code, a procedural sequence into a system, and it represents a conversion mode of operation. Referring particularly to matter, encoding represents the capacity to be programmed and converted into a set of coded meanings. So in other words, the encoding of matter is intended as the process in which matter achieves intelligence and is able to communicate that as agency and intentionality and extend across through human and non-human bodies. So I would like to take the opportunity of this lecture to expand uh, just at the beginning on the, on the theme of interconnectedness as the state of being connected to each other. And now it's actually manifesting itself through the public domain and social technical systems, which you know, both of these terms will be the underlying terms of, of the underlying thread of, of the lecture. But also I'm interested in talking about these terms, so both the interscalar, interscalar and the, uh, and the uh, interconnectedness uh, through the current conditions of society that we are experiencing right now, uh, not also looking at how um, interconnectedness, it's a view of the world that allows us to recognize the manifold states in which we are connected to each other, both as a human and on human bodies. The reason to bring this to the attention at the beginning of the lecture is because I see interconnectedness as a framework for design that gives us the opportunity um, to see the world as a connected whole, where each action is not independent, but deeply linked with the rest, forming a complex whole that operates as a system. And as we know, this spans from uh, uh, all level of the planet, from the socio-ecological to the socio-technical, to the human and non-human categories. The view, this view helped contextualize planetary and global events by understanding them as they might emerge from local conditions, but with consequences for the whole planet. So again, the, the relationship between the local and, and the, the, the planetary scale, the local and the global, and how this link somehow uh, is an important question for design as well. So this term serves as a framework in many fields. So if we talk about interconnectedness, in including biology, physics, sociology, and sciences in general. But my particular interest here is to explore how the encoding of matter manifests itself through the public domain and socio-technical systems. In the stack on software and sovereignty, Benjamin Bratton outlines a new theory of the age of global computation and algorithmic governance. He argues that the different type of computation that we are all immersed in, from smart grid to cloud computing, uh, mobile apps, the internet, etc., can be seen as many species evolving on their own, as a uh, connected, um, as a computational apparatus and a new governing architecture. As we link infrastructure at the continental scale pervasive computing at the urban scale and ambient interfaces at the perceptual scale, we will explore how this interweave and we might build, dwell within, communicate between and govern our worlds. Codependency, coupling and cause and effect determine how computation applied at the planetary scale is connected to the rise of new geographies that are both spatially situated, so localized, and globally expanded. While the public domain still represent the place where the character and the culture of society are materialized, 
technology continually redefines our transnational capacity. Cities are both, as we know, are both expressions of cultural practices and current technologies. And what we call ubiquitous computing takes into account the social dimension of human environments. Urbanity is rapidly changing given the accelerated rate of globalization and the ubiquity of ICT. So the question here is what opportunities and questions a system of network things offer for architecture and urbanism? In this context, I see the public domain as a stage for the notion of interconnectedness to manifest itself. Through a logic of interscalarity, I would like to focus on the public domain as the extended field where the public realm in general of society and the encoding of matter take place. Especially now, I think more than ever, uh, the reflection on the public domain is very important, is a very important parameter uh, uh, because in a way defines the way we, we live as a collective. So we, really, we know that, you know, given the current conditions, the public domain is the one that is transformed, but also is renegotiated with new norms. So we are challenged to redefine new norms for the public space, but also I think this is an opportunity for designers to rethink and redefine the fundamentals of living. Public realm and domain refers to the expanded sphere where individuals express themselves as part of a larger collective. As Richard Sennett argues that being public lies in the amount of knowledge one person or group has about others. So the question here, what does it mean being public? Sometimes the full potential of the public domain emerges in institutionalized civic spaces, but in other instances, sometimes the public realm emerge at the edges, borders, fragmented fragments of cities and liminal spaces between zones. In Senate essay about the public realm, he cites Anna Harent, where the public realm is understood mostly in terms of politics. Instead, Jürgen Habermans ties the public realm to economic interest, while Senate himself sees the public realm as less political and more cultural. Therefore, rooted in rituals. Now, given the current condition, the public domain is a point of focus where the politics of the body are redefined and also what it means being public is redefined, where the, so the basic social norms are transformed through distancing and self-protection rather than gathering and exposure, questioning the fundamental relationship between body and space and how the two relate to the public domain. So I believe that how we relate to each other is also how we relate to the city. And this is, uh, and this is part again of the public sphere and uh, looking really at the public sphere as the manifestation of society. We also are aware that we cannot talk about the public domain without referring to current technologies that redefine the sense of place or the sense of non-place. So we will expand a little bit on this later, referring to the Urban Machines book that precisely talks about the spatial and relational encoding of matter in the public realm. So my particular interest in the public domain brings me to expand on the notion of socio-technical systems. So how these two terms relate to each other. So the public realm is in a way is the expanded field where the deployment of socio-technical system are inherently embedded. A socio-technical system engages social structure, structures to develop the design of systems that involve people, technology, and their environment. If it recognizes the inherent relations between society's complex infrastructures and human behaviors. So if we look at the socio-technological theory, the, one of the main questions is how do we design such as systems and how those systems begin to enable somehow uh, the public domain itself. So society is not determined by technology, nor is technology determined by society. Both emerge as two sides of the socio-technical coin. 
So the relationship between society and technology has existed, as we know, since the beginning of humankind. But the difference between the past and present technology is the extent of social binding. The more, the more social forces it binds together, the more powerful technology is. The social shaping of technology recognizes that technology in general are outcomes of social action. So the question is, what is the social setting in which technology is deployed? Digital components such as software and data have special social and cultural life in and of themselves. The relation between code and space is both contingent and relational. So this framework um, is manifested through the research developed for the Urban Machine Public Space in a Digital Culture book published by List and co-author Wigger No Ritter. So the book reflects on the connection between relational and social systems and technology and how ICT affect the public realm. So through urban prototypes or what they're called here, urban machines, information technologies is represented as a catalytic tool for expanding, augmenting and altering public and social interactions in the urban space. In more detail, the book is organized into three main sections, essays, case studies and conversations. In the same section, there are uh, five um, categories. The second one is the case study section that represents an historical overview of selected projects that can be considered urban machines for their capacity of catalyzing the relationship between city, citizens, place, and technology through feedback mechanism. The third one is the conversation section that expands on several themes, including situated technology, data, participation, network, scenario planning, and open source city, among others. As framed in the book, urban machine can be accelerators of multiple urban operations. The generative potential of these interven interventions is the capacity to catalyze the process of co-creation of the open city, a city that can be transformed through the synergy of bottom-up and top-down processes. As defined in the book, Urban machines are interventions in the urban public space that function as a system and through ICT promote, test and prototype the relation between city, technology and the human scale. So some of these machines are more uh, temporary or interim than others, but all of them share the potential of providing a model that could be tested and possibly implemented in the long term in our cities. So these projects relate, um, the projects in a way are more, uh, it's a more an historical overview of selected urban intervention. So it's not only the recent project, but projects developed in the last 15 years. And all the projects share five specific categories and parameters. They are appropriative and adaptive. They're all prototypical. They are hybrid and systemic, performative, and also generative and catalytic. So in the way in which these projects were selected, we look back at the projects done in the last, uh, in the last let's say 15 years, projects, uh, not only small scale, but projects plugged in in public spaces uh, primarily, and all of them share these five parameters. So they intervene in the public realm as a system, as systems that are socially, technologically, and physically integrated. Environment, space, and technology at different levels are intertwined to produce a space that encourages new modes, new modes of urbanity for the public domain and the emergence of new forms of public life. So through the projects uh, and prototypes presented in the book, the research di dissects the modes in which special practitioners operate in the digital city. So one of the main questions that in a way frames the research in the book is how those type of intervention can help intensify the interaction between the public domain 
and the socio-technical systems. Two, with the goal of promoting urbanity. So four projects here will be presented through these four lenses. Uh, so these are projects that uh, I developed with my practice, Extopia. And, uh, uh, and the last one, actually, it's a project that we developed at YAC during the global school. So I will present that as well, because I think it's relevant as part of the current conditions. Um, but these projects are developed, uh, again, through the framework and um, through this framework, looking at uh, four particular type of uh, social technical actions, transcoding, networking, informing, and embodying. So these projects are all small in scale, uh, uh, but they present, so they, they both test and prototype, again, the relationship between the public domain and the socio-technical system. Uh, so there are three main parameters within which the projects are deployed. So there is a relationship between social technical encoding as the type of protocols that are employed. The second one is the spatial instrumentation as a device. So the projects act as a device or set of devices. And the third one is the deployment as strategies to reach both local and diffuse conditions. One, trust code as a social technical act. Urban Syncopation is a project commissioned by Nuit Blanche and exhibited uh, at the Gardiner Museum in Toronto. The, the project explored the notion of trust coding as a socio technical act. And here, trust coding, in very simple terms, is the act to convert language or information from one form of coded representation to another. Urban syncopation is a performative topography and facade prototype that temporarily inhabits the city and function as an infrastructural device that collects, transcodes, and retransmits the collective heartbeat of the city. The project explores the public domain through audio and sensorial data to register public life and ultimately urbanity in downtown Toronto. This web of sonorous and visual sensory data is meant to perform through the surface itself as an abstract index of urban life and collective living. The project embraces material behavior and performance as a means to derive the overall form. Each strata is defined through a series of pixels or modules to generate a vertical topographic pattern. The variation as the lateral compression and expansion of the folded surface emphasize the ways in which information is redeployed across the space. So each pixel is constructed as a flat surface to then be folded to achieve a three-dimensional configuration. And these vertical pixels operate as a building blocks of the world system. Each strata is associated with a street in downtown Toronto and receives data from each of the location. Sound sensors track urban activity level throughout the day and night and translate them into a rhythmic series of pulsating input, inputs and extracted data graphs. The collected soundscape here was transcoded and processed to visualize the amplitude of each sound and then sequenced as an horizontal array. In this project, the city is understood to be simultaneously material and performative. A physical artifact, as well as an infrastructure or stage for the more ephemeral activities of events of urban life to take place. The sensorial conditions of urbanity, and this is really what, the, what is the interest of the project, are captured in the piece in two distinct ways, one material and one performative. So the, um, the material aspect here uh, is, looking at, um, is looking at both the materiality and the geometry as the surface reflects, reflects, and fragments the surrounding space, as well as motions of visitors who become, who become both actors and audience in the space. The second one is, perf is performative. 
This direct form of material feedback is then augmented by a second performative layer, which is the streaming flow of pulsating inputs. Sound sensors located along the street in downtown Toronto are used to retrieve 12 hours of sound data to track proximate and distant urban activity levels throughout the day and night. Since sounds occur more in time than in space, each track of sound was then visualized as a running barcode that encoded the rhythm, frequency, and intensity. So the project explores form of rematerializing the sensorial city. The six layers continually stream pulsating inputs, producing a syncopated effect that renders visible the ephemeral events of urbanity. In the project, the sociotechnical act of transcoding operates as a translator between the material and the sensorial realm. It is a mediator among body, architecture, and urban protocols and the means by which the sensorial and experiential city is condensed and rematerialized. Two, network as a socio-technical act. I launch was, as a, was a co commission between Northern Spark and Zero One Art and Technology Biennial, and it was exhibited in Minneapolis and, uh, uh, and in San Francisco. This project explores the notion of networking as a socio-technical act. Networking here is intended as a distribution of actions, programs, and information. As stated by Peter Bishop and Leslie Williams, the concept of the temporary city emerges from the understanding that the city is rooted in a four-dimensional scenography. As we know, it's a space that changes on a daily and hourly basis. However, a one of the main challenge of the temporary city is the difficulty of designing using social interaction and participation. So this is a very important concept to understand this project specifically. In Mapping the Unmappable, Stan Allen describes the difference between autobiographic practice that depends on the author's original production and allographic practice. Allographic practice refers to notation and scripts as a form that allows others to follow design instructions. So social interaction and participation are choreographed through a set of design instructions that allow people to act upon. Allen also stressed the fact that allographic practice in urban design, in urbanism, it's a practice that allows for the collective. It works instrumentally to coordinate the actions of multiple participants. It suggests that the notion, this notion, so allographic as a practice, marks the shift from the production of space to the performance of space. So iLounge explored the public domain through allographic strategy to support public, public life and ultimately urbanity. iLounge is a device for placemaking where the visitors are an active part of its spatial production, providing a social stage to create a temporary community. The project emerges from the existing underused infrastructure of the city, nesting within the urban fabric. So the project operates as an uh, infrastructural platform. And uh, since the project really lived for about one year, so first it was installed in Minneapolis and then traveled back to California and it was plugged in in different cities. Um, so the project, so one of the main uh, um, framework for the project is really the project works as an infrastructure for a series of digital plugins. Also going back to the notion of allographic, a set of instructions inform the way in which people participate and, uh, and, and how programmatic and human occupation is defined. The third parameter for the project is that time and events, uh, because mostly this was exhibited during public events, are very important design parameters for, uh, for the project. 
Um, so the project was developed through anchor programs and activities related to multiple sites where it was, where it pl was plugged in, but also where it traveled over the period of one year. The modular system consists of a topography designed for different types of aggregation. So here you can see that, um, that the project creates, um, so it's constructed out of 36 elements as a total uh, number of units, but it's also able to create a, a set of different type of urban typologies, referencing types of public spaces, plaza, playground, parklet, and pod. The design suggests a dynamic carpet composed by the aggregation of truncated pyramids and horizontal connected platforms. The entire form was generated with rules that looked at optimizing surface space and proximity of programs. The power of instructions embedded in the modular uh, system lies in the continuous exchange between the analog strategies which are the material, which is the material and the analog narratives, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and digital strategies. So analog narratives in the form of questions to citizens were embedded in the space itself to trigger users' interaction and awareness of their surroundings. Digital narratives were able to create a responsive aware network. The first um, embedded microscale, so the project, even though was again developed as a, as a kind of infrastructure, uh, meaning uh, as a platform. Uh, so the first type of narrative, um, what we call embedded microscale, um, is composed by uh, live feed video cameras and screens that are embedded in the modules, creating a network of inputs, camera and output screens and the camera capture real time the social temporary space and send information to a screen located in the media proximity, creating a media echo of the temporary social space. The second one was this located macro scale. So an infrared camera is placed outside the eye lounge to capture the real time the space in its entirety, so the entire space, and the media footage is feed into a beamer station that projects the temporary social space onto the surrounding firewall with the idea of amplifying and creating a network of the social space cre created within the local condition of, of the project. So these are images of the event in uh, Minneapolis where it was installed first. And in one year, the project traveled to different locations in California, especially, and uh, uh, was installed uh, in public spaces and also in indoor condition to really see this as a platform to support media, uh, a series of media events. So the first one was called Fast Map. So these were events that we developed again over one year uh, as the piece traveled to, to different locations. The first one was called Fast Map map was a scripted, um, a scripted code to find the cheapest, faster way to extract information from the city. And that, that was then reprojected on the space itself. The second one, QR space, was a responsive virtual environment that allowed visitors to apply material surface to the, to the space via QR code applications. And the third one, I say, transform iLounge into a stage of interaction within the global online community. Uh, through Google platforms. So this was the only time where the place, where the iLounge was installed in uh, an indoor condition. So the project emphasized network as a social technical act and the ability to connect people and create a diffuse system of network communities. So to go back to the beginning for this project and going back to the the, the idea of uh, allographic practice uh, through uh, participation. Uh, so the project explores the potential of allographic urbanism uh, as the strategic choreography of uh, bottom-up participation. And, uh, uh, and this approach, working with notations, could be a direct and powerful agent of change, able to embody open source strategies as an instrument of collective empowerment. Three, 
in form as a socio-technical act. Data field, a project supported, uh, this project was supported by uh, the Arts Council of New Orleans and it was developed and uh, designed in New Orleans. Um, started, this project started in 2016 and is still going. So the project explore here the notion of informing as a socio-technical act. Informing here is, in, is intended as the act of giving form and life through information influences. The project in particular explores the public domain through data implemented through systemic and relational approaches and show how they can be a powerful tool to design in soft land and act upon the complex water ecology of hidden infrastructural network of the city of New Orleans. So this project, um, as I said, developed in 2016, was a competition uh, developed by the city of New Orleans and the Arts Council to create a placemaking intervention along one of the main canal in the city of New Orleans. So after, of course, the, uh, as, as a way to uh, create awareness of the water, the hidden water infrastructure of the city. Um, and connecting with, again, with the, with the, with the, macro, uh, with the macro system of, uh, of canals in, in New Orleans. So really the, this, the project uh, is part of the, the city strategies to show how cities can live with water within the context of rebuilding infrastructures through the lens of resiliency. So the project makes a connection between the topography of the city, so that in New Orleans, it's, a, it's an inverted topography, so it's below zero parts of the city, uh, and it's intricate water infrastructure network that uh, in New Orleans is essential for the way in which the city functions and exists. So a network, so here you can see, um, this is a map that shows the, uh, the network of pumping station in the city of New Orleans and how these are connected. And so the project really starting acknowledging that and defining this network of macro and micro points to establish the relationship between the pumping station and the, then the respective capacities. So linking these points to the sectional and representation uh, to the sectional representation of the topography, the project becomes a responsive and inhabitable three-dimensional map of the city's water infrastructure, while acting as a placemaking machine along one of the main water canal in the city of New Orleans. Here, the gradient, the gradient that you see from light to dark poles show the inverted topography of the city and how data begin to inform matter in its manifestation. The macro poles are placed in direct conjunction with pumping station locations, responding to real-time data of water capacity. The layer machine allows for the cohabitation of people, communities, and the constant mutation of informed phenomena. The large macro poles record frequency and intensity of pumping activity at several New Orleans pumping stations referencing real-time data and translating to signals and translating uh, the, the data to signals and, and text. The technologically mediated narratives work across scales from the individual to the collective. The upper mediated environment is generated by a range of data related to water dynamics, rendering a reality in constant mutation. Data field is designed to raise awareness of the water network of the city of New Orleans, making it visible and draw the community towards water related issues. So the project aims to establish a platform for citizens to share and communicate the challenges and opportunities that New Orleans faces in living with water. Here you can see the, um, the test for the large scale prototype. So this is just one unit. And uh, so after, uh, after the project was developed, um, also um, the, mm, the Arts Council of New Orleans wanted to build a small scale prototype to continue to raise awareness of the water related issues and to see how this small prototype that is much smaller than the larger 
you know, that the project itself could start to bring awareness to, um, to water related issues. So here you see, you see the, um, the small prototype that was built, uh, was built in New Orleans. And this small prototype works exactly in the same way in which the large prototype works. So it's a scaled map of the city where each pole corresponds to a pumping station and live feed data are registering water fluctuation. So here, as you can see, these are the, the names of the different pumping stations that are in the city of New Orleans and how, um, and the amount of water that in a way, in, on average, is pumped by uh, defining this by uh, cubic feet per second. So this project, again, was a very important to test, to test the project, waiting for the kind of long-term uh, long implementation of the, of, the, of the larger prototype. And so here you can see um, in a, this very short animation, you can see how the project was generated. So here you can see how the, the poles are working and how, how the network is working and, uh, and how basically the inhabitation and the responsive component is working through, through the interior space, Pump, notating the, the pumping station and the map. So really this project works as a three-dimensional inhabitable map of the water infrastructure of the city of New Orleans. So also as an expansion of the research related to data, in spring of 2018, I co-curated an exhibition during the 2018 Venice Biennale at the European Cultural Center. So the, the exhibition was titled Data and Matter and featured 12 projects that engage the relationship between data and matter called code and space. So the exhibition takes the opportunity to exhibit a range of exploration that transform data as an abstraction, uh, as an abstraction into spatial and performative configurations. In particular, explore the use of emerging forms of reading and producing spatial conditions that connect and visualize data through micro and macro scales. It aims at triggering discussion and debate on how the use of data in design methodology has evolved in the last two decades and how processes of data measurement, quantification, simulation, and algorithmic control integrate into methods of making. So this exhibition was in a way the, the extension of uh, some of the themes that emerged from the data field project and uh, um, and, uh, uh, and it was again a way to explore uh, uh, the relationship between data and matter through different scales as well. Four, embody as a socio-technical act. New Sense, which is a project developed in New York at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And this project was developed um, as part of the YAC Global School that uh, I directed in 2016. And I want to show this project because in a way it talks about, um, talks about the, again, the relationship between socio and technical. So the socio-technical act through the notion of embodiment. So this project in a way is very different than, uh, than the other project because it's developed in, uh, um, in, uh, in an academic context and relates with the work uh, at YAC uh, in the global schools. Uh, but I want to present it because also give me the opportunity to discuss the politics of the body, especially in the current, in the current condition. So embody here is intended as, the, uh, as giving form to the body, as incorporation, uh, as a relational system. So the project here is, explores the public domain through the body as a socio-technical apparatus and the presence of body and biometrics in the public realm. I think this is also an important topic for the conditions that we are living in right now, where the politics of the body, as we know, have completely uh, redefined. So the mode in which uh, the body relates to public space uh, as a sensing mechanism, a relational device has changed. Uh, and biometric technologies, for instance, decide now, you know, who goes where, and while other type of uh, uh, relational behaviors dictates 
codes of distance and proximity modifying the relationship between the body and space. So I think this theme, uh, this is one of the reasons why I wanted to incorporate this project in this presentation, because I think if we talk about public domain, and if we talk about, um, we cannot talk about public domain if we don't talk about the body. And I think this relationship between body and, and space mediated by technology, I think it, it's, it, it's changed uh, given you know, the current conditions that we are in. So the project investigates how environment in which we live in affects the body. In particular, explores the dynamic relationship between the scale of the macro or the environment and the micro of the body through four sites in New York City. The framework explores the notion of social ecology intended as the interaction between social and environmental systems. Relationship between environment and context and body and biometrics here are uh, in a way are the platform to understand how the city is experienced and how the environment affects the body through feedback loops and responsive mechanism. So the project started by looking at, um, sorry, looking at four uh, prototypical sites in New York and, uh, um, and, looking, uh, and looking particularly of how uh, these, these sites are completely different from each other. So we, we started from the Brooklyn Bridge, uh, moving through Washington Square Park, and then moving to Grand Central and top of the rock. So each site was chosen because it's very different in nature in terms of urbanity and terms of public life, and also in relation to the ground of the city itself. So the project engages simultaneously two sets of data and sensing devices, looking at environmental sensors, sound, light, temperature, humidity, and CO2, and body sensors, heart rate, stress sensor, and skin conductance. So the first step of the project was to uh, build the data acquisition unit. That here was intended as a portable device able to be attached to the body to record and store in real time data sets of each of the four sites. This is the trajectory that you can see that basically um, started from the Brooklyn Bridge all the way to top of the rock. And through evaluation and comparative processes, patterns of reciprocal data behaviors started to emerge. So we were looking at the data as this notion of codependency, how the, the, the data from the environment start to affect the body and vice versa. So the data acquisition units, here you can see the data acquisition unit in different locations, measuring uh, biometrics, um, and also measuring biometrics and the environment data simultaneously. This is at the end. Uh, this, is top of, this is on top of, the, top of the rock. And here data was stored in real time and uh, um, in real time, and here we started to generate average values. So the data was uh, collected from sensing platforms, stored and organized into quantifiable sets, which were then translated and parsed into uh, using computational processes to visualize information and relationship into patterns and geometry. So this is the beginning of translation into the geometry. A pneumatic structure made out of reflective mylar material was used to express the dynamic and temporal qualities of the body and the environmental phenomena. Geometry was first tested into small prototype units to understand the inflation capacity relative to structural performance. Here you see the piece deflated. Here you see the macro component um, still you know, partially inflated. So a series of linear testing were performed to evaluate the relationship between air supply, the system of interconnected uh, inflation tubes, and the form finding process. Once stable forms was achieved, the system was aggregated in its final configuration and ready to receive biometric real-time responsive mechanism. So here you can see the different testing through the inflation system. And, uh, and, the three, and the three inflation units as well. So the last phase was to plug in uh, the physiological responsive units. 
Each individual spatial responsive unit was assembled into a macro spatial map that was layered with the embedded biometric sensor to provide real time responses and feedback. The first unit, Grand Central Station, sensed in real time the heart rate. The second, Top of the Rock, sensed in real time CO2 in the breath. The third, Brooklyn Bridge, sensed in real time skin conductance. So here you can see the, uh, the, the, the feedback uh, mechanism of, uh, of how the system works. And here are the sectional conditions and scale. Users were able to plug into the physical prototype, reading various biometric data, providing actuated feedback through breathing, inflation and deflation, and pulsating, lighting effects. Here you see the three units and the real-time display of data. So the testing of those interdependent conditions can be accelerated of ways in which we can understand urban space. So the project invites us in a way to rethink the relationship between the individual and the collective in cities through a uh, body as a site and how reciprocally can begin to influence each other. You can see the effect here when, uh, uh, when there is no interaction and, uh, uh, and the project responds in a way the feedback loop of data recorded on site. And so I think this project, again, uh, question, but also I think opens up possibility to, again, discuss uh, the public domain uh, through, uh, through, uh, through the body. So with this quote, I would like to go back to the beginning, to the main framework of this lecture that links together the notion of uh, interscalar interconnectedness enabled by technology with the public realm and socio-technical systems as manifestation of society. So the most profound technology here are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they are indistinguishable from it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcela. Um, we don't have a digital clapping yet uh, for uh, this virtual uh, public space, but I would invite um, everybody uh, that is attending to uh, switch on their cameras and they can also um, uh, unmute and, and directly ask uh, questions to Marcella. And in the meantime, I will go through the Q&A section and a couple of, of comments that I have from my side so I can warm up yeah. uh, also the, um, uh, the group here. Um, thank you, Marcela. It's, um, it's, it's a big debate, uh, uh, the, um, the, um, the territory of technological applications into the public realm and the public space and society, how it will affect it. Um, and um, I, I, I couldn't help uh, thinking during your talk that uh, with everything that is happening now with uh, the pandemic, there is like a conspiracy theory or a series of conspiracy theories surrounding it. And one of these is related with the fact that um, um, now more than ever, surveillance technology um, uh, will come to stay, no? Um, there is already pop-up uh, or more temporal surveillance uh, measurements that are being taken from measuring your uh, temperature, but also to uh, cameras that um, are able to detect um, uh, where you are or, or uh, mobile apps that uh, know where you have been, if you have been close to an infected person, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a lot of, a lot of discussion around the topic of, um, um, of uh, biometric data that uh, we need to give uh, to governments um, or biometric data that we need to use in airports to travel from now on. Um, and we also see that a lot of countries were already, or some countries, were already um, applying this technology before uh, any health crisis whatsoever. So my mm -hmm. question is, uh, whereas you believe that um, this kind of technology, the surveillance, let's say, technology, whereas it is compatible or, or, or it can coexist or how we can take advantage of it if there is any positive uh, aspect in its, um, in its basics, um, and coexist with a more bottom-up strategy of placemaking as the one that you were actually argumenting uh, through your work in, in your talk today. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I think this is a very important topic nowadays because I think biometrics in urban space always existed. But I think now we are experiencing this more than ever. I think if, uh, uh, if we just, you know, start talking about contact tracing, um, in a way, it start to uh, contact tracing and the way in which it works. We know that big corporations now are employing technologies and Bluetooth technologies uh, for, as a framework for contact tracing. So that is able to, in a way, um, uh, detect through uh, Bluetooth radios uh, people that have been uh, infected or people that have come in contact with people that someone that has been infected. And so, um, and so I think this really questions, you know, the notion of privacy, because if, if we see, for instance, the app that has now been developed by Google and Apple, right, uh, uh, is only working with Bluetooth technology, it's not really working with, uh, uh, with GPS data, right? So yeah. in a way, it's not geolocalized, but at the same time, so they argue that in a way it's more, uh, it, it doesn't really question privacy. But, uh, but definitely does. So I think, uh, uh, I think that's one uh, very important component when we talk about surveillance, surveillance as a kind of whole and how biometrics start to inform that. Um, at the same time, I think, um, I think there is also this, the, you know, the notion of control and power and how this, uh, you know, start to act, start to act upon, uh, upon the urban system. So I think it's a pretty, um, so it's a layer condition that again does not only engage you know the individual and the collective but there are larger forces at play so i think what we experience right now you know as a uh, that's why i wanted to include you know the last project because you know as a way to maybe begin to expand a little bit on this uh so um, you know i'm particularly interested again on the relationship not only of the body and city but the politics of the body and I think now, you know, with the pandemic, the politics have, have been completely redefined, meaning that um, uh, how we relate to each other, right? I think things that were, are proper, you know, from the medical system, like uh, self-protection and distancing uh, and defense somehow, now is really part of uh, how we experience the social space. Uh, and, and I think this, you know, start to really question in a way also the fragility of, uh, uh, of the public realm as well. Uh, but at the, at the same time, I think, uh, you know, the public domain, it's really, uh, I'm, you know, I'm interested in that because I think it's, it's one of the stage where uh, really the, the projection of society happens. And, uh, um, and I think that's what we experience right now with the pandemic itself. Uh, at the same time, <laughs> at the same time, I think that, um, that this condition is also working as a kind of acceleration, I think, of certain processes, which means that uh, the which means that the urgency, I think, of looking at the the questions that we have and looking on how can be resolved is in certain parts, I think, is becoming more urgent, and uh, and probably in the long term uh, or even in the short term. I think start to accelerate certain processes that, again, not only at the urban scale, but I think at the at this at a society at large. So I think we'll see how develops the, this also. I think in relation to uh, in relation to um, time, because I think uh, um, I think how long it is going to last. I think is crucial to really understand how some of these changes perhaps become more permanent or less permanent. Even if we look at the, you know, we look at the uh, how we work right now, right? So probably some of them will stay and will be more permanent. Some will be more, will not, will transform. Um, thank you, Marcela. Um, I I would like to invite this anonymous attendee uh, that is on the Q and A question, uh, if he or she wants to uh, share with us uh, the question that have uh, written on the chat about the idea of coding or coding. Um, I can read the question if you are not there for any reason. Um, Marcela, you can also have a look at it at the yeah. Q&A section, uh, which is, uh, um, the question is, isn't it the idea of coding inherently cryptic and how then is the average citizen who most likely lacks the tools to decode these patterns how is he or she supposed to recognize these patterns, origins? So I'm reading it right now. Yeah. 
I think you know the the the, the coding or data. I think it's a it's a it's a complex topic, meaning that I think uh, there are different levels within which I think we can uh, begin to engage with that as coding and decoding and uh, and and understanding also this uh, uh, the translation using data as a means of translation, um, and uh, I think I think here. Um, the decoding, I think it's always uh, the decoding meaning as a kind of translation. I think uh, it, it's given by the, the level of access of information that you have and how uh, and the type of granularity that the system has. So I think one thing that is very relevant, very important when we talk about data, which is the granularity of the system, which means that, uh, uh, you know, we talk a lot about big data, etc. But uh, it's not about accessing, you know, one specific, you know, that set of data but how many levels you can have you can access that system so i think that the notion of granularity is very important because it goes back to scales and it goes back to interscalar conditions and i think with the coding is the same type of is the same type of condition Okay, um, I have a question from Pino, Caroline, and then I will invite Denver from Johannesburg to, to have uh, his question. Um, Pino, would you like to, to share with us uh, your thoughts? I also want to say that the uh, the book, since we were talking about the book, and I want to uh, talk about List and uh, um, that List supported this lecture, and uh, and uh, and um, and also there will be a code that will be shared here in chat if you're interested in the book that will give also kind of a um, a discounted uh, discounted code for the book itself, since we are waiting for uh, for more people to engage in the conversation. Sounds good. Um, for a reason, Pino, we cannot hear you. Can you unmute yourself? Well, Denver is unmuted, so Denver, go ahead. All right, thank you. Uh, Hi, Denver, how are you? All right, and you? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, my question, uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, we yes. can hear you perfectly. All right, my question is, um, by the way, do you need to see my camera? Is my camera on or how does it work? Uh, your camera is off. Okay. I don't know where to switch it back on. I can only see the mute button anyway. Um, but we both uh, live in third world countries. Uh, you live in Brazil and we live in South Africa. And um, some of the examples we showed from North America in first world countries um, uh, work really well, and some of them take on a um, very artistic uh, performance like uh, role. Um, if one had to start to consider these methodologies of of data and performance and um, in 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 a third world country like like Brazil in South Africa with real deep social issues and, 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 and um, disparities, mm -hmm. how do you think that we could, firstly, what strategies would we use? And secondly, what do you think is important to measure in, in countries like ours? Yeah, I think that's, you know, very interesting question. So I've been to, as you know, to Johannesburg uh, last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and I think you know it's and also I lived in New Orleans for for a long time, which is a different type of conditions. But I think mm. uh, but I think it's definitely you know one relevant question. And uh, and I think some of this project, in a way, um, uh, not necessarily are trying to you know resolve issues, but more giving uh, some type of uh, uh, scenarios of way in which things can be connected. Mm. And uh, and I think this uh, um, I think the the way in which you know we look we look at the urban scale it's uh, uh, it's uh, we have to be aware of the context that we're working in meaning that of course if I work in New York or if I work in New Orleans or if I work in Johannesburg I will be I will start looking at the city with complete different eyes uh, not in a negative or positive but different uh, especially you know really 
begin to uncover what's there and see that as a, as a potential. Um, so I think you know some of these projects also start to intersect with the with with the with the logic of prototyping, urban prototyping, that again is not uh, that, that could be um, uh, not necessarily a strategy, but as a way to begin to start to uh, to see how a model can be applied and replicated, uh, perhaps in similar contexts, but also can be changed and adapt to. To another to a different context meaning mm -hmm. that uh so when we talk about prototype pro urban prototyping usually you know the, there are there are three steps that if we look at cities for instance or we look at you know the, the kind of paving to park movements adopted in san francisco that was really work with a, with a kind of framework of prototype adopt prototype replicate and adopt so the mm -hmm. replication in a way is the question of how a model that is still abstract in the replication can be adapted somehow. And then the implementation um, and the adoption, which is the long-term implementation, is the potential for this type of interventions to live in the city in the long term. So for instance, if you look at the, uh, you know, the parklet movement in San Francisco really started as a kind of uh, guerrilla type of uh, um, taking over the city from really a bottom up. And now the parklet, you know, since 2008 are implemented uh, in the master plan of, of cities. So mm -hmm. start to really act within the urban fabric. So I think in the, in the, uh, if we look at prototyping as a more abstract universal model of testing relation between things, among things, uh, I think the replication and the long-term adoption, this is when things start to be, could potentially be tailored and, uh, and, uh, and looked at the more contextual conditions. Mm. And and also these projects again, even though you know small scale, um, they are testing somehow ways in which things can be combined from both from the social scale, the urban scale, and the public life. Intended as um, not because you know it, it's about resolving an issue necessarily or partially, right? But begin a conversation of how that issue could be uh, could be seen from uh, uh, from more a relational system. So I think the, um, you know, we have seen things that failed. We have seen things that were successful, or even if you know, if you just talk about urban prototyping, uh, because also perhaps the parklet works in San Francisco and doesn't work in, uh, in New York or doesn't work in a city where it's mostly uh, uh, car driven or, or, or vice versa. So I think these are definitely important questions, I think. Mm. So in other words, you're saying that the, your methodology is is robust enough to be adapted and applied to other societies and communities and then whatever is is drawn out from those communities can one can start using the a similar uh, methodology of practice and it's applicable to different different kind of conditions um so i don't i, I think the um you know, it's not the fact that I really see this as a kind of methodology necessarily, uh, but I see as, as an attempt to, uh, to begin to test uh, this type of, to test this type of relationship for so the prototype, it's really a testing device in that sense. And, uh, and then I think the, the kind of long-term long -term implementation is kind of the second, is kind of the second step. And um, so, I think you know there are instances. If we look at the urban prototyping movement that started in 2008 with the with the um, with the parklet, etc., uh, we have we have seen cities where these things have failed and these things were actually su succeed. And so that's I think the risk that we take all the times. All right. Thank you. Practice. Thank you. Thank you, Denver. So um, Caroline raised her hand for a question, and then we also have. Uh, in the chat, a question from Zordi. Does any of the two uh, want to make the question live? Well, Zordi is asking, uh, whereas uh, beyond the performative art, um, if there is uh, any other way or how do you think we can use cities data uh, in built environment and buildings facade specifically? 
I'm reading, yeah, beyond performance harm. Building facade. Yeah, I think, you know, we have seen uh, instances and projects that begin to touch on, on data. And I think, you know, I want to go back to what we we're talking earlier about data, that I think uh, data, it's a, it's a kind of uh, uh, a controversial um, term as well in term of, uh, uh, in term of, I think, you know, when we talk about access and we talk about uh, the use itself. Um, and, uh, um, and I think here the, um, you know, we saw project, even if, you know, we go back to the early project where again, the, the, the kind of public facade becomes more way of registering, registering urban conditions. So I think if you look at projects from the, from the, you know, 2000, et cetera, that, uh, we're working more, working more as a kind of the performative aspect of data in that sense. Uh, but I think uh, I think data now are become an instrument to uh, are becoming an instrument to begin to uncover uh, uncover uh, societal you know the way in which society and the conditions are uh, are in a way developing. So I see the instrumentation of data as a possibility here. Uh, and specifically, I don't think it, you know it's about the facade or non facade, but I think this brings up the larger question about data. Um, and accessibility and granularity as, as I was talking about. So what I'm saying is not just the performative aspect of it. I, I want to, to, to maybe continue a bit on that because I had a, um, a similar um, question in mind, uh, especially with your project in New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's um, it's very interesting to, to see public space, uh, not as uh, just a physical, um, let's say, space for social interaction uh, made out of uh, physical materials that one can touch and, and, and feel, but also with uh, augmenting it with uh, information, with data that, um, as, as you were uh, sowing in your project, could somehow raise awareness, but could also make transparent this data, no? Which I think it's very similar also with uh, uh, the question on, on using the building's facade as a kind of a new urban infrastructure for visualizing information, uh, data that otherwise people uh, don't have access to, no? And I wonder, whereas this could not only raise awareness, but through this kind of exposure um, uh, of data, especially if the data represent this specific community, this specific geolocated community, whereas this could also drive into certain changes of behavior or, or um, 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 uh, lifestyle of, of people, no? If, for instance, I'm able to see the amount of water that I am consuming in a building or the amount of energy that my building consumes versus my neighbor one is not just raising awareness, but it's also a kind of a driver to probably change my behavior in a different way. So do you see that as a possibility? Yeah, for sure. I think the, you know, the New Orleans project was, uh, was uh, it really started from, uh, uh, from the notion of uh, uh, making, um, the uh, the data so really how the infrastructure of the city works daily uh, or every you know every hour every minute uh, and uh, so because you know even you know people that for instance you know live in New Orleans not everybody knows that the pumping stations functions 24 hours in order to keep the 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 city uh, the city uh, working somehow. So really the project started from this idea of how we can make uh, this public and available and at the same time begin to specialize this, the data and in the case, the, the, the water, the pumping station of the city to bring more awareness. So definitely I think there is, there are, I think, you know, going back to the question, I think awareness has, has multiple layers. So which is the, you know, kind of direct awareness, but also the, the way in which, um, awareness can live in the long term. And this, I think, is when it starts to affect behaviors specifically. And, uh, and definitely, I think the visualization of data, you know, this go, you know, going back to the question of the facade and going back to the fact that it's not only performative, but it starts to be actually informative and, uh, uh, and a means to, to expose issues or, or good things as well. Um, I, think, I think it's crucial. So at the same time, we know that, you know, access to certain type of data is difficult. 
So for instance, you know, for that project, uh, that was one of the main struggle in the sense that, um, in the sense that, you know, that there are again, different levels in which data are public or non-public or owned by companies, et cetera. So, uh, so that's the biggest yeah. challenge always when we are working yeah, of course. with data. Of course. Where do we find the data? <laughs> right. Do we create it? Do we right? And uh, um, and so it, that project specifically really touches upon you know really it lives in that delicate balance between the uh, the exposure of the data to the collective to the citizens to the people of New Orleans really using that to bring awareness of even how the different parts of the city floods during the day, but also the fact of how many water is pumped, you know, from the, you know, the pumping station that is next to your house, for instance. And now actually, uh, um, again, looking at the city as a kind of mechanism uh, that operates 24 hours and, uh, and how that, in a way, we have to uh, be aware and respect that somehow as a kind of way of living in, in cities as well. So definitely, yes. Thank you, Marcela. Um, uh, does anybody have a last question for Marcela before uh, closing this uh, lecture uh, this evening? Anybody can unmute, switch on their camera, raise their hand. Okay, so um, Marcela, thank you for uh, joining us uh, from uh, Brazil. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, with us uh, your work. I think it is uh, it is crucial to um, you know understand or explore different aspects of technology, um, not necessarily being technophobic, but uh, understand technology in a more critical way and how it can serve society rather serving uh, some um, uh, big companies that uh, use this information against the users. So um, thank you for this message uh, uh, tonight. And um, I hope we will be able to meet soon physically together with you and all the participants today. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, yes, I hope to you know, continue this conversation in different forms and uh, physically and non-physically. <laughs> thank you. Thank Thanks you very everyone. much. Bye bye. Thank you everybody, have a nice bye. evening. Bye bye. And see you um, on Thursday for our next um, lecture, which is not actually a lecture, it's a debate um, on um, our REAC journal publication of Black Ecologies. Uh, we'll see each other in, in a couple of days for that. Thank you, Marcel, and thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.